wish we could be together in this room. It's very strange to be here without all of you here singing and praying together along with me. But nonetheless, I want to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a lot of things that have been said about the current situation that we're facing, the current circumstances that we're in. I'd like to just remind you of, of one important truth, and that's this, that all the circumstances of life that we face are, are from God. God's not shy in the Bible about making this very clear. Even when calamity is described in the Bible, the Lord says, I, the Lord, am the one who creates calamity. I know that this has been a difficult time for many. Many are in fear of what might happen in the future. Many have been financially uh, uh, affected by this through the loss of employment or, or the reduction in employment. Some of you have perhaps known people who are sick from this terrible virus. And it is important at times like this to remind ourselves that despite all that pain and despite all that difficulty, the Lord is in control. And the reason why that's good news for us as Christians is because we know something about the Lord who is in control. This God, our Creator, is the one who loves us. In fact, the Scriptures tell us, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not, together along with Him, freely give us all things? In other words, if God loved us enough, to send his one and only son for us, then the scriptures assure us that he will not hesitate to freely give us all good things. He's a loving heavenly father who knows what we need before we ask and who will not give us that which is not for our good. And so we look with a sense of confidence on these kinds of circumstances. This is why the Bible could say be anxious for nothing and Jesus can remind us that who of us, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life. This doesn't take away the sting of living in a fallen world and dealing with the consequences of that fallenness, including this virus. But it does remind us that in the midst of that sting, we can look forward to a time when the Lord will wipe away every tear from our eye. And we can even look at the present time, knowing that he is the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted. So let's take a few moments, silently prepare ourselves to worship this God, this sovereign creator of heaven and earth, this loving heavenly Father, this Lord of all creation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear God call you to worship this morning. These words are from Psalm 147, beginning in verse 7. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. In light of that call to worship our God, let's look together at hymn 100, actually Psalm 100a, shout to the Lord all the earth. 
our sovereign creator God, we thank you that even in the midst of difficulty, you are near to us. We thank you that even though we are far apart from one another, yet your Holy Spirit is at work in our midst. We thank you that we can come even now and worship you. We pray that you would find our worship unusual as it is, acceptable in your sight. Please be with us by your spirit and govern us by your word, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We have the opportunity, as every Sunday, to confess our faith together, to declare what it is that we believe. And this morning, we'll be declaring that faith, confessing that faith, using the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. I'll both say the question and the answer. And the question goes like this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'll read the whole psalm and we'll read it together. Psalm 139 reminds us of the Lord's presence with us no matter where we are. Beginning in verse 1, to the choir master, a psalm of David. This is the word of God. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them. With a complete hatred, I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's confess our sins together before the Lord. Our holy and righteous God, as we come before you now, we freely admit that we come to you as sinners. Father, often, in the past days, we have forgotten your presence with us. We've looked for comfort, for security, for safety, 
in all kinds of other things. Father, we have not honored you as we ought to with our thoughts. We have, in fact, oftentimes questioned your goodness, your care, your love. Father, we are a very fickle people. When we look to our nation as a whole, we confess as well that we have many sins. We ask, O oh Father, that you would pardon us, that you would pardon us as your people, and that you would pardon even our nation for the sins we have committed without repentance. Father, you are a gracious and a merciful God, but also a holy God. And we come to you in light of your holiness, asking for your pardon in Christ's name. Amen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you sincerely confess your sins and have repented and are trusting in Christ, listen to this good news from Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In light of that, let's sing together hymn 245, the very familiar hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn 245. 
majestic is your name in all the earth. When we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have put in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Father, we are very aware of the many dangers that beset us on all sides. We are perhaps more acutely aware than we have been in the past of our own mortality. We pray, Father, that you would be near to us during this time of national difficulty and this time of difficulty within our church. We ask, Father, that you would be with those who are in authority of, over us in the civil sphere. We pray that you would be with our president and with federal officials in the Congress, in the courts. We pray that you would be with those who are defending us at the national level. We ask that you would show kindness and grace to those at the state level and the local level as well, many of whom are making very significant decisions. Father, they need your wisdom. We do pray that you would give them great courage, uh, but also great insight. May they, uh, may they not be reactionary. May they be careful and thoughtful. And may they consider the safety and well-being of all of us who are under their authority. Father, we know that you have appointed all of our civil authorities for this moment. All of this is under your control, and yet we ask that you would be with them. We ask that you would be with them in such a way that they would make decisions that would enable us to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness. When we look to our own church, we have a great many needs. Father, you know that some among us have lost their jobs because of this virus. We ask that you would meet the financial needs of those people. We ask that you would be a comfort to them. We know that you are called the God of all comfort. We know that you are a God whose power is perfected in weakness. Many of us, Father, are struggling with great fear and anxiety about the future. We ask that you would comfort us with the promises of Christ, that you would be near to us by your Holy Spirit, that you would fix our minds on eternal things, on eternal truths, on unbreakable promises. We pray for those who are isolated and alone. We ask that you would be a friend to them, a shepherd to them. We ask, O oh Father, that you would enable us in whatever ways we can to reach out to those who may lack regular face-to-face -face fellowship. We pray that you would use us as ministers of your goodness and your grace in creative ways during this time. We thank you, O oh Father, for this great news of the birth of Tim and Carla's baby. We thank you for her safe delivery. We pray that you would be with little Charlotte that you would continue to meet the physical needs she has. But more importantly, Father, we ask that she might not know a day when she did not sit under careful teaching from your word and a godly example. We ask that you would draw her quickly to faith in Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, for the needs of those overseas. We recognize that while we are affected greatly by this disease, other nations have been affected perhaps in even more significant ways. We pray for our missionaries who are serving in this difficult time. Give them courage, give them wisdom, give them an understanding of how to navigate these choppy waters. Father, we pray that you would keep us faithful to you, faithful to your people, faithful to your church, even during this time. We thank you for the guidance we get from your word, for the clear promises, and for the blessed hope. We look forward to the return of our Savior, and we ask that that return might come quickly. And in the meantime, Father, we would ask for your strength. 
In Christ's name, amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. We'll begin at verse 27, where we left off the last time we were together and looking at this in person. And we'll go all the way through verse 38. So Mark 8, beginning in verse 27 and going through verse 38. And remember, as you read and as I read, this is God's word. Mark 8, 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray together. Our great God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is never bound, that your word never returns to you void, that your word always accomplishes your purposes. We ask, even on this day, that your word might accomplish its purpose in our lives, in our hearts, in our congregation as a whole. Father, bless your word. Speak by your spirit through your word to us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's important to remember the context of this text when we come to it. You'll remember that earlier in Mark chapter 8, we see the varying responses of people to all that Jesus was saying and doing and preaching. In fact, one of the ways that this is summarized or visualized for us comes right before the text that we're looking at this morning. You'll remember that Jesus heals a man who's been blind, and as he heals the man, he heals the man in several stages. So it begins with the man seeing people, but seeing them as trees walking, and then it ends with him seeing very clearly. It says in verse 25, his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And I mentioned this at the time, and I think it's worth remembering it now, that the reason why I think that miracle occurs in that way is not because Jesus lacked the power to heal the man immediately and fully. We see very clearly in Mark's gospel that he has the power to do all those things. But rather, it's because it's illustrating the way in which Jesus' message was being received by the people who should have known him best. Uh, they are seeing things in, in some detail, but not very clearly. They're, they're starting to understand some of the broad outlines of his ministry, while not having sharpness in understanding all of his ministry. We're going to see something like that in the text we're looking at today, because we're going to see both the misunderstanding of the people and then the misunderstanding even of Jesus' own disciples. And it's in the midst of that misunderstanding, in the midst of that lack of clarity, that Jesus gives some of his most profound and significant teaching in the Gospel of Mark. I think one way to understand the text that we've looked at this morning is to look at the key questions that are asked. We know that sometimes teaching happens best in a kind of Socratic method, when you, when you have a dialogue between the individual and the teacher based on asking questions and stimulating 
critical thinking to draw out underlying presuppositions. And I think there's something of that in this text, because what we see in this text is that Jesus asks two questions at the beginning of the passage, and then two questions at the end of the passage, and each of those sets of questions draws out the important truths, I think, that we're meant to see. Let's look at the first question. The first question comes in verse 27. Jesus has now moved into the villages of Caesarea Philippi, Mark tells us, and as he's on the way, as he and his disciples are walking to these villages, he asks a question, who do people say that I am? Now again, it's worth reminding ourselves the way in, uh, the way in which questions function in the Bible. Uh, neither Jesus uh, nor the Lord, when we see him ask questions in the Old Testament, is ignorant. Uh, Jesus isn't asking his disciples because he doesn't know what people are saying. He knows the thoughts of men's hearts. The Bible is very clear about that. But nonetheless, he asks this question in order to elicit from them a response and to, in a sense, show us something uh, of where they were in their thinking. Now, in asking this, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's giving a kind of window into the responses that he's receiving. So he says, who do people say that I am? And they respond to him and they give a number of responses. They say, verse 28, John the Baptist, some say, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. These are each interesting answers. On the one hand, we might say that these answers, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, show that the people were beginning to think spiritually. They were beginning to think religiously. Uh, this answer about Elijah means they were even thinking biblically. They were thinking in terms of Old Testament revelation. The Old Testament revelation about a coming Elijah, a coming prophet that the prophet Malachi uh, promises for the people. And yet, at the same time, while the people are thinking somewhat spiritually, and while the people are thinking religiously, we could even say that people are thinking miraculously, because John the Baptist had died and Elijah had long since left the scene, even with their miraculous spiritual religious thinking, they were decidedly wrong. Jesus was greater than John the Baptist. John himself made that clear. Jesus was far greater than Elijah. And certainly Jesus surpassed any one of the prophets. And it's worth thinking just for a minute about the people's answers here. Because at a superficial level, as good as they were, uh, we see that the Lord had not yet opened their eyes fully. They were still like this man born blind who saw shapes, but it, the men looked like trees walking. Uh, that's where the people are when Jesus sort of takes their spiritual temperature in verses 27 and 28. You know, we see a an illustration of what's going on here in John chapter 6. In, in John's gospel, there's a, there's a key point where Jesus teaches quite clearly who he is, and many people seem to ignore it or misunderstand it. The disciples pull Jesus aside and ask him what's going on, why are so many people leaving after you've made these things so clear, can you explain yourself a little bit better? And what Jesus does in John 6 is he, in a sense, pulls back the curtain and what he tells his disciples is that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws that person. But if the Father draws that person, then he will certainly come and I will raise him up on the last day. And so we have to see that that's what's happening here with the crowds. Uh, the Lord was, had not opened their eyes. They were still blinded by their sin. They were blinded even as they looked at the scriptures. They were misunderstanding who Jesus was. It's a reminder, I think, too, of the status of Jesus' teaching and message during his own day. He was misunderstood. He was despised. He was rejected. Uh, Isaiah 53 says, We esteemed him not, even as he came, came to, bore, to bear our sorrows. Well, that's the first question. The first question has to do with the conventional wisdom of the day. 
The second question uh, appears in verse 29. Jesus aims this question not at the crowds or at the people more generally, but specifically at the disciples. He asked them, the text says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gives a remarkable response that shows just how much God had been at work in their hearts, showing them the truths of the gospel. Peter answered him, you are the Christ. You know, it's interesting, in Matthew's gospel, we get an even greater uh, explanation of what happens after Peter makes this confession. We're told in Matthew's gospel that when Peter makes this confession of Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, uh, Jesus gives this incredible promise. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Some have asked why that's not included in Mark's gospel. And the truth is, we don't know exactly why it's not included here. I think one very good hypothesis is that it's not included because, in a sense, it draws uh, attention to Peter, and Peter was the source behind Mark's gospel, and perhaps for that reason, out of a kind of humility, out of a kind of right understanding of who he was, Peter omitted this uh, from the account. But we don't know for, for certain why that is. I, I, I think in addition to the, the possibility of Peter leaving it out, there's also the fact that that doesn't really have to do with the main point that Mark is making here. Matthew, of course, is preparing his readers for a greater understanding of the church and Christ's work through the church. I think what Mark is doing is he's here giving an account of what it is that, uh, the, how it is that the people are responding to Jesus and what we ought to learn from that. So, in any case, it's not here, but Peter's confession is here. You are the Christ. Now, what does that lead to, that second question? Well, it leads to Jesus giving a remarkable explanation of the heart of the gospel. It's interesting because if you were to look at the gospel of Mark and divide it almost precisely in half, this is about where you'd end up. If you put all the verses in the first half in front and all the verses in the second half behind, you'd end up just about here in the middle of chapter 8. And that may not be relevant, but it is worth saying that this confession, this, this teaching that Jesus gives, is certainly at the very heart of everything Mark has been trying to show us. It says, he began to teach them in verse 31, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again, and he said this plainly. You know, there is a sense in which this is the very center of the message of the gospel. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's God's holy anointed one promised in the Old Testament and now revealed in the coming of Jesus. And what did that Messiah come to do? What was at the heart of his life and his mission on behalf of the world well it was suffering it was rejection rejection not only at the hands of the romans but of the chief priests and the scribes the religious leaders of the day and then of course after that rejection and crucifixion and suffering comes the resurrection in verse 31. now what we see is that while Peter and per presumably the other disciples understood that Jesus was the Messiah, this explanation of what the Messiah came to do, what the Messiah was about, what was at the core of his life, uh, was something entirely foreign to them. They were still more like the crowds than they might have thought. Because even after Jesus says this plainly, Peter pulls him aside and begins to harshly rebuke him. But as Peter is rebuking Jesus, Jesus then rebukes his disciples. He rebuked Peter in verse 33, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. 
For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Their understanding of Jesus as the Messiah was a carnal understanding, a worldly understanding. They have got the title right. They understood something of the storyline of Scripture culminating in Jesus. But they failed to understand what it was that God was doing through Jesus and what Jesus had come to do. You know, I think it's worth pausing here for a moment and just saying that there are people today who would perhaps say that Jesus is the Christ. Maybe they don't even know what that means. Jesus is the Messiah, though, they might even say. And yet they fail to understand that to call Jesus the Christ, to understand him for who he is, the Son of God, to understand this is to understand that he came to suffer, to die, and to rise again. There are many today who appreciate the teachings of Jesus, who perhaps in some respects see him as a great man. They love the works that he does or did, and yet they don't understand, appreciate, or trust in for themselves this death and resurrection. Well, if that's the case with you, then the Bible says you're still lost in your sins. In fact, Paul says if Christ is not raised from the dead, then all of us are lost in our sins. Our faith is in vain. Paul says our preaching is in vain. We're found to be liars in everything we say about God. You know, the cross and the resurrection is something that we cannot make peripheral. We can't forget. There is a sense in which when you read Mark's gospel, you realize this cannot be emphasized enough. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he begins to preach in Corinth, says, I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This wasn't, uh, for Paul, a failure. It wasn't uh, an instance of the Apostle Paul misunderstanding or having a, a kind of singular one-track mind being unaware of the social problems. No, Paul was fully aware of everything that was going on in Corinth. Paul was fully aware of all the implications of the scriptures. And yet Paul wanted to be known as a preacher who did one thing, which was to proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. And in so doing, he was doing nothing more than what Jesus himself did when he came to explain what it meant that he was the Christ. You know, Jesus does more than that here, though. Because Jesus begins to probe a little further by asking questions that get to the heart of Peter's rebuke. We may be puzzled by Peter's rebuke. We may wonder why it was that Peter didn't simply say, Lord, I will let you define what you are here for. I will let you define what it means for you to be the Christ. And I'll learn from you. But he doesn't. He rebukes him. And I think Jesus diagnoses why Peter rebukes him and why, I would argue, many today reject these truths about Jesus' death and resurrection. What Jesus does in verse 34, after telling the disciples that they're not setting their mind on the things above, but on the things below, he calls the crowd and he says this, this is not disconnected what is, with what has just taken place. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. I think what Jesus recognizes, and this is revealed in the questions that he asks just after this, is that the reason that people are so resistant to the notion of Jesus' death and resurrection is because, of course, they have their minds set on the things of earth and because, at a fundamental level, to recognize this about God, to recognize this about the Son of God, is to recognize another important truth, which is that we have to set our minds on things above, deny ourselves, 
and take up our cross as well. Jesus says, whoever would save his life must lose it. Jesus advocates an entirely different approach, not only to understanding who he is as the Christ, but to understanding life itself. You know, we see this played out before our eyes, what Jesus says here. We see played out before our eyes the lives of people who believed that they, who believed that they need to hang on to everything in this life. And what happens to those people at the end is they end up being bitterly disappointed. Uh, they recognize that these things that they struggled to attain, these things that they fixed their hope, their affection, their energy on in this life, ultimately amounted to very little. Whoever would save his life must lose it. How does Jesus drive this home? Well, he asks two rhetorical questions. Remember, he began this text with two questions about who everyone thought he was and specifically who the disciples thought he was, and he ends with two questions as well. There are questions that really answer themselves. In verse 36, he asks this, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The answer, of course, is, is obvious. You can gain all that there is in this world. You could have riches and relationships, fame, health. And if we were to lose our souls at the end of it all, we would gain nothing. He puts it in this way in verse 37. What can a man give in return for his soul. The answer to that, to that is obvious as well. None of us, in and of ourselves, possess anything that we could exchange for our eternal soul. And yet in asking those questions, of course, Jesus calls us back to the very heart and center of his ministry, that he came to suffer, to die, to be rejected, and to rise again that we might have the hope of eternal life, that we might not have to forfeit our souls, that we might, yes, lose the world, but in losing the world, gain life eternal. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples, and this is what Jesus is teaching us today. If we embrace Jesus, we gain our soul. We have hope of eternal life. We have hope of a life beyond this life. And I would suggest to you that particularly during this hour of great trial and need for many of us, we know this acutely to be true. We know that what we need is hope beyond what this world has to offer. We know that we need hope for our very souls. This is what Jesus promises to us. He puts it this way in verse 38. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory with his holy angels. That's what we look forward to. We look forward not to this world and what this life has to offer. No, we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ when the one whom we are not ashamed of now on earth is not ashamed of us when he comes with his holy angels. You know, the question we have to ask at this point is, how do we know that this promise is true that Jesus makes? How do we know that this promise in verse 38, this offer of our eternal souls being given to us, is true? And I would suggest to you there are at least two proofs that are embedded in this text. Embedded, really, in the whole Gospel of Mark. Embedded in the whole Bible. So the first proof is a proof that we've had amply demonstrated for us on the pages of this book. But it's really everywhere in the Scripture. And that's the proof from Jesus' own power. Remember, in Mark's Gospel, Mark takes great pains to show us Jesus' power over death itself, Jesus' power over demonic forces, Jesus' power over nature. Jesus is the Son of God. 
Mark, in a sense, keeps hitting us over the head with this. He's fed 5,000. He's fed 4,000. He's healed the blind. He has set people free. He's forgiven sins. That's the kind of power Jesus has. And if Jesus has that kind of power, and, there, and then Jesus makes this promise, it's a promise we can bank on. Or just think about how the book of Revelation describes Jesus when it wants to tell us that which we need to know about the Lord, particularly in times of trial. Now, Revelation says this, Jesus declares about himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, Revelation tells us that Jesus is the Lord over the church. And then the book of Revelation tells us that he and he alone is the one who is worthy to open the scroll, which in a sense lays out all the events of human history. Remember what it says when they give the scroll and no one is found to open it in heaven and on earth. John says, I wept much for no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then they sang this new song. And they said, you're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. See, it's because he is the one who came to suffer, to be crucified, and to rise again, that he is worthy that he is the one who will also come again one day and take us to be with him. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed. It's not just Jesus' power and Jesus' work on the cross that guarantees the truth of these sayings. It's also the very promises themselves. We have promises embedded in this text, and we have Wonderful promises in the rest of Scripture. Remember what Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Or Jesus' own words, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Or perhaps the words of the Apostle Paul, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And then Paul goes on to say this, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You want hope? You want to gain your soul? You know it won't profit you at all to gain the whole world and lose your soul. Look to Jesus. Look to the one who died and rose again, who offers forgiveness, who offers hope for eternal life when he returns, who offers all of this, and who has the power to make good on that offer. You know, at the heart of Mark's gospel is this ringing question. It's in a sense the question that should be asked of us every time we open the gospel itself. It's the question that Jesus asks his disciples. But who do you say that I am? Jesus, we know, is the Christ, the Messiah. The one who carries out the purposes of God through suffering and death on behalf of sinners. Do you know him in this way? And then there's that other question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Well, the identity and work of Jesus has massive implications for how we look at life right now. 
and perhaps one of its greatest implications is that it points us toward eternity and it points us toward the unending love of the one who himself suffered was rejected and died in order that we might live let's pray together our great and loving father we thank you for the message of the cross may we never lose sight of it we thank you for the truths of who jesus is father may they those truths those realities become ever more real to us even now Father, I ask that you would cause these truths to be sunk deeply into our hearts, to cause us to look away from the world and the things of the world, and to look to our heavenly hope. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our coming King. Amen. Please join me in singing our final hymn, a very appropriate one, a very well-known hymn. If you're using the Trinity Psalter hymnal, it's number 244, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, 244. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.